Good. So welcome. Welcome this morning. Uh, first of all, thank you to, to Vladimir, uh, to Brian uh, and Tina, um, and especially uh, and as well, uh, Amanda Graham in the Environmental Solutions Initiative in putting this together and, and helping us link for this really wonderful event. I'm going to be spending just five minutes talking about uh, the Environmental Solutions Initiative, but environment more generally, <coughs> because MIT is really committed to uh, bringing uh, solutions and partnering um, with diverse entities all around the world on bringing on environmental solutions to, 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 the, to our most intractable problems. Obviously, climate change is top of the pyramid, but many other environmental cha challenges already mentioned is urban air pollution, um, uh, pollution generally. And so I'm, the, I'm introducing, um, as director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative, the mission to advance science, engineering, policy, and social science, design, and humanities, and the arts towards a people-centric and planet-positive future. I'm thrilled to have heard so much about the Sustainable Development Goals this morning. Uh, you can see that I generally wear this, the SDG <coughs> pin, because, and, and that's, very, um, that's very purposeful. Solving environmental challenges, addressing climate change, will not happen without a focus on development, on uh, human well-being, on raising living standards, and, uh, and producing a sustainable and humane future. So that's really the, the mission of the ESI. I only have three minutes left, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. The Environmental Solutions Initiative at MIT uh, works through research. Um, uh, the, we work through the core missions of the Institute Research, Education, and in convening, and convenings like this, um, gathering people together uh, with our partners on campus. Uh, initiatives here on campus are most successful when they partner with other initiatives here on campus and, and then link with uh, partners beyond MIT. ESI domains and I'm happy to talk with anyone about this uh, at length um, in, at a break. Um, the domains are climate science and earth systems, cities and infrastructure, and sustainable production and consumption. And s several topics have already mentioned, been mentioned in increasing urbanization, rapid urbanization that's happening today and will for the next several decades, on the prospects for a circular economy um, and, uh, and listing the best technology to get there. A couple of examples of this. On one end of the spectrum, we've really launched in a serious way to investigate a whole slew of nature-based solutions for making a more sustainable world. We have, with our partners, Conservation International, launched into investigating how artificial intelligence, advanced materials, robotics, um, and the traditional fields of ecology linked to engineering might make for um, tackling issues of biodiversity and enlisting natural systems to uh, mitigate carbon emissions globally. On the other end of the spectrum, we're also focused on the consequences, the direct consequences of our, econ of our global economy and society. And so we've launched a large project in uh, plastics in the environment. One of the speakers in this session, in this environment session, is involved in articulating the research goals on the material science side, Jeremiah Johnson, the second speaker. Um, and the plastic in the environment for us is uh, a challenge to enlist the specific capacity at MIT to really tackle this problem with many other partners around the world. This is, a, this is now a, a concern that has generated a great deal of interest and we think we have unique capacity in material science in materials, material science in sensing at the nanoscale and other scales um, to really tackle um, and solve this problem. So with that, I'm going to end. Um, we're thrilled to be involved with the environment, with, uh, with, um, with Sense Nano today. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to the first speaker, uh, Bradley Olson, who's right here. Bradley. My group is in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Um, we actually focus uh, typically on working on discovering uh, and understanding next generation polymeric materials using biotechnology, basically biochemistry as the basic mode of synthesis. 
One of the areas where this is very, very interesting is biosensors. Uh, Protein-based biosensors are an example of natural material that's already been put to work today, um, solving a lot of interesting societal problems. And looking out at the room, I think uh, we talk about generational breaks in many different technologies, but in this room, there's probably a generational break in biosensing technology. Um, for, for people in older generations, probably certain diagnostics that you had to have performed at the doctor are now performed at home using affordable biosensors. Uh, examples of this are home glucose testing and home pregnancy testing, um, where today we have very interesting technologies uh, for these types of biosensors. Um, other examples where, where this is a, a very useful technology are, are different types of sensing arrays. Um, one challenge that we're very interested in is how do you improve the performance of these sensors using nanotechnology in order to make them more useful for a wider variety of different types of applications. So traditionally, you'd make a biosensor by taking a protein and immobilizing it on some sort of a surface. And I, I draw here the highly idealized, perfect situation of the current state-of-the-art technology, which is to take the, the protein or sensing moiety and basically have it all perfectly oriented in a dense monolayer on whatever surface you have. Um, and the best comparison I have to this is this is like the 1950s post-World War II American living where everyone has a ranch house, right? And we, we, the ranch houses, of course, are never this close together. And uh, since I work in the triangle-shaped building, we know that they're never this well packed uh, to fill space. Um, and in reality, there's many defects and a lot of space. <coughs> what we're trying to do with nanotechnology is move from this sort of 1950s ranch house to downtown Boston, right? So can we use nanotechnology to build essentially nanoscopic skyscrapers of protein packed and arranged in these dense arrays that still allow transport in and out of the sensing material, but dramatically, by several orders of magnitude, improve the density of protein on a surface? The reason this matters is because the, the sensitivity of these affinity biosensors is governed basically by the Langmuir adsorption isotherm, and I show the equation up here. Normally, the way people improve sensitivity, basically trying to detect the smallest possible concentration, is by changing KEQ. But there's also a prefactor out front, N, the number of binding sites. And if we can increase N by several orders of magnitude, we can increase the number of absorbed binders, and we can therefore increase the signal that we get out of the sensor. And so being able to build three-dimensional nanostructures like this gives us a, an opportunity to, to try to increase this end and therefore increase the sensitivity of the sensor. So the approach we take to this is actually using uh, engineering proteins into fusion constructs and block copolymers to fabricate nanomaterials from globular proteins. So I show here briefly a synthetic strategy for taking an antibody and selectively functionalizing it at its base with just a single polymer in order to form what looks like a block copolymer, where one block is a synthetic polymer, in this case, N-isopropyl acrylamide, and the second block is an entire folded human IgG antibody. And due to steric occlusion of the second reaction site, once you get one polymer reaction, we basically can form just one-to-one -one block copolymers, which is what I show on the protein gel here. We characterize these with small angle X-ray scattering and transmission electron microscopy when they're self-assembled into solid state thin film. So we take these molecules and we make them into basically block copolymer plastics that look and feel kind of like SEBS plastics, but are made of about half protein by weight. And X-ray scattering patterns um, of, of uh, materials both in solution and in the solid state and TEMs showing lighter stripes amidst darker regions where these darker regions are the protein these lighter stripes are the polymer, suggest the ability to self-assemble into lamellar type layers. <coughs> What's really impressive beyond the ability to build three-dimensional nanostructures of these materials is that protein polymer conjugates or fusion proteins have a very high viscosity compared to protein solutions. And this allows you to incorporate it into industrial polymer processing equipment. It allows us to process sensing layers in ways that we would often uh, think of processing polymer films. And so we actually just take simple glass substrates, silicon substrates, or even fabrics, and we can flow coat or dip coat the polymer, block copolymer coatings right onto this surface. We lightly cross-link it in glutaraldehyde for about 30 seconds to immobilize it, and then we're left with a sensor that when introduced in contact with some sort of a, a functional moiety um, can produce a sensing response. So here we took our, our antibody films and we initially synthesized these with a uh, polyclonal IgG, 
because you can buy it in big bottles. Uh, just as proof of concept, we stained it by doing binding with uh, protein G, fit C labeled protein G, and then we look at the sensing response out of this type of material. And while this isn't a sensor useful for any sort of indication, this clearly shows the ability of switching from this sort of low functionality to high functionality and improving the sensitivity of the sensor. So here we have the intensity, the fluorescence intensity at the surface by this very simple readout plotted against concentration. And the mono layers give a very, very low response because there's not a lot of protein. But these three-dimensional nanostructures give a very high response and a limit of detection that's about two orders of magnitude lower than in the monolayer system. And so this, this uh, simple proof of concept illustrates the ability of building with nanotechnology instead of using just simple adsorbed protein monolayers to transformatively improve the sensitivity of biosensors. So at this point, we got very uh, involved in a collaboration um, with one of my colleagues, Professor Hadley Sykes in the Department of Chemical Engineering, who's working on engineering new small protein binders for a variety of different diseases, uh, things like Zika, malaria, tuberculosis, in order to address concerns in, in world health and try to develop new low-cost point-of-care diagnostics. In many of these problems, uh, one of the big challenges is being able to produce very, very high sensitivity so that you don't need to culture organisms or enrich blood components before being able to do a test. And so she was developing small molecule protein binders uh, that we collaborated to synthesize into complex <coughs> fusion constructs uh, that basically polymerize the binders into large protein blocks. And then we link these protein blocks to different types of polymers. So we did this because each individual protein is pretty small, and this allows us to make very large sort of polymeric style protein blocks and link them to different polymers. Uh, a lot of details of the self-assembly that are very interesting to us as polymer physics, basically uh, physicists, show the ability to control the phase diagram as a function of the molar mass of the protein. Essentially, bumping up the molar mass of the protein allows it, us to drive it from a non-assembled state, this is just the monomeric protein, into assembled states for the di, tri, and tetrameric protein. So essentially, by pushing up to a high molar mass, we can drive assembly. Um, the advantage of working with these small molecule binder proteins is, of course, you can get very, very high densities of active binding sites and potentially big jumps in, in intensity. And so we, we started in this project with uh, an example protein uh, from Professor Sykes' lab that just binds uh, monomeric streptavidin. And so we fabricated our block copolymer layers on surfaces using these different materials and uh, bind it with monomeric streptavidin to show selectivity. Um, so here, here basically the selectivity is, is very, very high just for this one protein. And again, you can see uh, improvements in the limits of detection uh, for a monolayer versus for the different binding proteins uh, with different tetramer, trimer, dimer, and monomer. We have the highest, uh, high, or the lowest limit of detection, excuse me, for the trimer, uh, which uh, interestingly is the one with the highest degree of ordering in the nanostructured material. And so, so this is suggesting uh, interesting relationships we don't understand yet about controlling nanostructure, transport, and ordering that can allow you to produce decreases in the limit of detection in these sensors. Um, one third example I want to show of this, this nanostructure control using copolymers is the idea of making encapsulants for biomaterials that can allow them to be simply coated. Um, we've become very interested in a encapsulation technology known as complex coacervation, uh, which was, I think, originally developed by a number of groups at UMass, also in the Netherlands, um, where you take uh, copolymers, block copolymers, where one side is uncharged and one side is charged, and this charged side of the copolymer will interact very strongly with biomolecules, including DNA and enzymes. And this is often used as a technology to package DNA or RNA for gene delivery. Right? You can also, and when you mix the protein and the block copolymer in solution, if the electrostatics of the system is controlled correctly, this will self-assemble into ionic core micelles. Basically, block copolymer micelles in solution, where self-assembly is driven by charge. You can then coat this into films nanostructured films, and you can use this charged copolymer to control the structure, distribution, and presentation of the protein. And in particular, you can use it to stabilize and maintain the dispersion of the protein in the solid film and allow you to produce a, a, a material of interest. Um, in particular, we're trying to use this technology to produce sensors for heavy metal contamination in water. Um, 
And this is a very interesting technology to us, as I show here in an SEM. You can very simply dip coat or flow coat, again, these materials to produce, for example, fabric coatings or integrated sensors in textiles. So the way we developed our particular example sensor I want to show you today is using this copolymer of polyvinyl pyridine with uh, ligoethylene uh, glycol uh, methacrylate. We used an apoenzyme alkaline phosphatase, which, uses, which has high catalytic activity in the presence of zinc and very low catalytic activity in the presence of all other heavy metals. And this basically gives you a sensor selective just for zinc in complex metal mixtures. We coacervate this, we flow coat it using simple sort of industrial processes, and then UV irradiation for about 60 seconds immobilizes the film by cross-linking the benzoquinone, so everything becomes insoluble in water. Um, the ape enzyme sensors have a very high selectivity for zinc, so the control is very low, signal in zinc is very high. Copper, cobalt, and nickel produce very low signals, and the zinc will outcompete all of these metals in order to produce high sensing responses, even in the presence of these metals. Um, we can do detection in mixed metal system. Um, so we show uh, the control with added zinc against copper, cobalt, and nickel. Um, CRW is Charles River water. Um, so we don't know exactly what's in that, but we can definitely detect zinc in the presence of that. Um, this is filtered Charles River water, so we actually took the solids out before we tried to run the test. Um, but it works well, e even in these sort of environmental uh, uh, samples. Um, so, uh, in, in basically summary, you know, there are many challenges uh, in selective detection and pollution monitoring in environmental sciences. I think I showed an example for heavy metals. Also, things like hormones, toxins, and microorganisms are very, very interesting to us. And there's a lot of synergy between these applications in the environment, but also in, in defense, industrial monitoring, and health sciences. Um, and finally, I think biosensing presents many solutions and also many challenges at this nanoscale and biomaterial scale where there are opportunities to fundamentally consider the way we build the sensing materials and improve their performance for next generation devices. All right, I'd like to end by acknowledging a number of people in my lab who contributed to these projects, our collaborators at ORNL and two folks at MIT, and our funding sources. Thank you.